Good morning and welcome to the first DHSB whole school assembly for quite a while. Obviously it's going to look a little bit different this morning but we're determined to make sure that life continues as normally as possible and it's fantastic to be able to bring the community together for a short time to share experiences, some advice, a bit of friendship and a little bit of history which connects us all with events that occurred many decades ago. We're unsure how long the present situation will continue but invite anyone who would like to contribute to future events, future assemblies, to get in contact and share some of their ideas of how to cope without school with the rest of us. So, working, relaxing, ways of exercising, please share them with all of us. So, what can we promise this morning? Some rather strange dancing, a rock god history teacher, Miss Davison dressed up as her favourite paintings, some fine advice from DHSB's own Joe Wicks, Mr Manley, and the English department extolling the virtues brilliantly of reading. However, tradition dictates that we start with Mr Huck's summary of the fantasy football league results while we've been away. And, for the look of Mr Huck's tables, it's been a fascinating last month in the Premier League. Well, with Mr Huck indisposed, as we'll see in a minute, it calls to me to announce this month's Fantasy Football League Manager of the Month. And it is quite extraordinary. It appears we have the closest Fantasy Football League Manager of the Month competition of all time. And at the top of the list, as you can see, is Mr Huck and his Huckster All-Stars with a magnificent nil points. Uh, closely followed by Chris Hibbert with nil points. And it's got to be said, Mr Berryman has got to be pleased with his timely nil points. As you can see, both Mars FC and the Salty Seagulls have a magnificent nil points. It, it just couldn't be closer. And exciting news has just come in that Norwich City are equal with Liverpool this month on goals scored, goals conceded and points gained. Definitely Champions League form. And now we come to the final result. The closest ever. And with over 90 winners, all on nil points, Mr Huck has been spotted buying lottery tickets, desperately trying to cover the cost of all the prize money. Special congratulations from Mr Huck goes to Mr Manley, who achieved his best ever position in the Fantasy Football League with a commendable nil points. I wonder what's going to happen next month. And speaking of Mr Manley, he may not know a lot about football management, according to Mr Huck, although he seems to be doing quite well at Bournemouth at the moment, but he has made a short film about the importance of keeping a healthy exercise regime during these strange times. Hopefully this will inspire some of us, all of us, to take up running, cycling, all sorts of sporting activities to keep fit and with all the positive benefits this will bring hopefully we will be able to keep up the new regime even after lockdown is over in order to live a longer healthier and happier life hi everyone i hope you're well just finishing my daily run I wanted to share some of the reasons why it's important to get out Firstly, it's just really nice to get out of the house. Um, it's great for your fitness. It's really important for your physical and mental well-being. And finally, if you're like me and you're eating loads of rubbish during the lockdown, it's nice to burn off some of those calories. The last thing from me, I hope you've been able to access and enjoy some of the things the P department have uploaded onto the Google Drive during the lockdown. 
Okay, take care. Of course, Mr Manley isn't the only sports guru we have at THSB. When we ask staff and students to suggest the best way to keep fit and have fun with all the family while in isolation, it was dancing which came up time and time again as the most popular recommendation. And of course, anyone can do it. And in the running for title of Joe Wick's Looky Likey of the Year, it's got to be Mr. Weymouth, who can throw shapes with the best of them and has a style all of his own. Yes, it was recording. If that wasn't recording. <laughs> Over the last year, a large number of students have become increasingly interested in climate change and the green agenda. And some have argued that the present crisis allows us all to re-evaluate the way we do things. A positive influence of the present crisis could be that government and people across the world will come together and demand that we don't simply go back to the old ways of doing things. Here are some of the organisers of the school climate protest group to talk about coronavirus and green issues. While much of the coverage towards coronavirus has been rightfully negative due to the effect it is having on billions of people's lives, it is important to remember that there are also positives. A tide of humanitarianism has spread across the world with many hundreds of people coming together in a time of crisis to do what they can do to help. To this end, there have also been positive effects to the planet. Many heavily polluted cities where smog is an issue for daily life have experienced a vast increase in the air quality that surrounds them. Residents of New Delhi have observed that skies have turned blue and many people can see the Himalayas for the first time. Meanwhile, in Venice, Italy, the canals have become so clear that fish can easily be seen. These are but a few examples of the unexpected upsides of lockdown. Who would have thought that it would be a global pandemic that would prove to the world just how easily things can be changed? However, climate talks have been delayed to next year because of the outbreak, and there are fears countries could prioritise economic welfare before that of the environment. Many are questioning whether the world will just go back to the business as usual approach when it recovers from the pandemic. The progress that we have made towards our climate goals during the pandemic could very easily be removed within just a few days. This is why the Earth's climate should be one of humanity's major priorities after this current crisis ends to prevent one of a different nature. Thank you. Throughout this assembly, there are some fantastic examples of our school community getting together to inspire, support others and start to get creative. A really good example of this is the following musical performance. In a well-deserved break during a busy day in lockdown at school, Mr Adams and Will Wooler decided to make some music together. 
Listening to and playing music are both fantastic ways of relaxing and finding inspiration. So without further ado, here is Mr Adams and Will performing an unrehearsed fantasy piece by Nielsen. It's been wonderful to see all the different original and innovative ways that you have been coping with the demands of the lockdown. It hasn't been an easy time for those who are missing loved ones, away from friends or feeling helpless in the face of all the changes. Hopefully some of the examples here will give you an idea that you can adapt, use and enjoy as we move forward. 
We're all part of a big community in DHSB and there's always somebody available to help with ideas if things are difficult. Anyway, here are just some of the activities that people have been getting up to over the last few weeks. Mrs Buckler has been amazing over the last few weeks, sorting out technology for staff and students. It's unsung heroes like Mrs B who make it all possible for us to continue to be as close to normal as possible. She sent in this short video full of sound advice. Hi everyone, welcome to homeschool at our house. Um, I've been relegated to the kitchen, so I'm I'm balanced on our breakfast bar, um, which isn't doing my back any favours because my partner's bagged the, the best P PC in the front room while he works like nine till 3.30 sort of rigidly and I can come homeschool these guys at the same time as doing my own work, which has been working okay actually. Uh, my two are in Horrorbridge Primary, so what we've worked uh, what we found out that's worked really well is trying to stick to what they would have as a normal day. And as part of that, we've been having PE every day. So yesterday we set up circuit training in the garden and we had some burpee stations and some trampolining and some um, sit-ups and stuff. So I thought it was good fun. I'm not sure it went down particularly well. But it's really important, I think, to get outside every day and to schedule your day um, so it feels like you're being productive as well as having some sort of downtime. Technology has been phenomenal and using Google Meet and things like Kahoot, I'm able to host quizzes for like my friends and family. Um, in fact, I've been almost more social than I was before we um, kind of came home. Um, I've also got a new group of teacher friends um, who I've met online that are all playing Animal Crossing on the Switch. So, you know, make make use of what's out there, okay? And don't forget to have some um, relaxation time as well. I hope you're well. Seb Brooke came up with a wonderful idea for making exercise more interesting. And what he did was he measured the length and the height of his garden and then using the measurements, worked out how to climb real mountains while still in his back garden. You could develop this to walk to amazing, fascinating places without ever leaving home. Brilliant idea, Seb. And Mr. Roberts learned how to make the most amazing pizza. And Mr. Riggs has gradually been turning into a rock god. See if you recognise any of these. Hello. Uh, I've been playing my bass rather a lot. So here it is, a Roger Waters signature precision bass. So here's a bit of Pink Floyd for you. Formula One. Meanwhile, Miss Davison has been turning herself into famous paintings. And Mrs McGowan brilliantly has spent the last few weeks making face mask straps for local hospitals. Absolutely amazing way to spend your spare time. And Dr Goldville has been stargazing, looking for meteors in the clear night sky. Of course, the lockdown has provided us all with the perfect opportunity to delve into the wonderful world of books, and there are so many out there to choose from. You can use the 16 by 16 reading list from the school, and many sites are allowing free downloads of classics and recordings. With this in mind, here is a video from the English department to suggest some of their favourite reads at the moment. Hey, English! I've run out of books to read! 
can you send me some more? Hey, this is Johnson. I've got my favourite book for you. It's by Margaret Atwood and it's called Oryx and Craig. Catch! Thank you, Mrs. Sells. Oh, I love a dystopian novel. Okay, so, Mrs. Varian, the book I'm recommending to you is The Book Thief by Marcus Suzak. Absolutely wonderful. Be ready for some tears. Thanks, Mrs. Johnson. The book for you, Miss Nally, is called The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Catch! Thanks, Mr. Varian. Always wondered how you say that name. And for you, Mrs. Waterfield, I'll send you If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things by John McGregor, the great mix of poetry in a novel form. I hope you like it. <laughs> Thanks, Miss Nally, that sounds grand. So, Mrs. Webb, I have for you The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, who's an American writer, and it's all about forbidden love and challenging social norms. It's a bit emotional, so enjoy. Thanks, Miss Waterfield, for oh, The Age of Innocence. The book I'm recommending to Mrs. Sheridan is I Know Where the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. I hope she enjoys it. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Webb. So, Mrs. Downs, I'm recommending to you Planet of the Apes. It's a great science fiction, a classic. There's a film you could look up as well. I think you'll really enjoy it. And you get the 3D specs as a bookmark. So it helps you look at the cover properly. Bye. Oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Sheridan. I've never read Planet of the Apes. What a lovely thought during lockdown, another book to read. In the interest of sharing the love of reading, I've got a book that I want to pass on. So one of my all time favorites, a bit chunky, keep you going for lockdown. I'd like to pass this to Miss Redmore, who lives just a few streets over. So hopefully she'll be able to catch this. Refugee Boy, a simple but really powerful narrative, so I hope you enjoy it. Thanks! It is sometimes easy to forget that whilst the present crisis has brought out the best in people, communities coming together to help the vulnerable, NHS staff going far beyond the limits of most people, and friends keeping in touch to make sure everything's alright, there will always be some who try to pin the blame on others because they are different. If one thing comes out of this period, it should be that we try to keep the positives going and to change society and the way we treat each other. With that said, here is a summary of some of the prejudice that has been happening in the last few weeks. To start, I'd like to focus on the idea that nobody is safe until all of us are safe. Due to COVID-19, there has been an alarming rise in racist incidents directed towards Chinese people and other people of East Asian heritage in many countries, including the UK. As this clip from Amnesty International demonstrates, when people stigmatise others for who they are, they spread the disease faster. Another significant issue at the moment is the danger COVID-19 poses to refugees. These people already belong to some of the most marginalised and vulnerable groups in society, and they are therefore particularly vulnerable during this time, 
because they often have limited access to basic needs such as clean water and health facilities. To illustrate why we must fight prejudice and protect others, here are two clips. The first is from the UN Refugee Agency and the other focuses on how we can extend our compassion to help the Rohingya people. conclude, the present crisis has brought out the best in people. It has shown us our capacity to be compassionate and our willingness to help and support others in truly awe-inspiring ways. Therefore, from this point on, we should continue to help others. We should fight prejudice in order to protect the vulnerable members of the international community because no one is safe until all of us are safe. Sometimes, when the night is at its darkest, it allows us to see the radiant beauty of the new dawn with more clarity. Who can ever forget the amazing sight of Captain Tom toddling down his garden with his frame on his way to raising tens of millions of pounds for NHS charities? Or the sight of all the great buildings in this country lit up, including the Tamar Bridge, to celebrate the great work of our doctors and nurses. The last few days have been really important in the life of our city. Last Friday was the 75th anniversary of VE Day, victory in Europe when the Second World War ended for the people of Plymouth. And Plymouth had suffered more than most cities in Britain. But despite the losses and terrible destruction of the Plymouth Blitz, the people of Plymouth came together, rolled up their sleeves and created a new and better world. And maybe that's the inspiration that we should take forward as we move on over the next few years. Hello. I've just been asked to give you some personal reflections on uh, the 75th anniversary of VE Day. 8th of May 1945, Winston Churchill came on the radio and announced to everybody that the war in Europe was now over. It had been going on until from September 1939. And for people living in Plymouth, what they had seen was the complete destruction of their city. The 
centre of town was virtually gone. It was just simply a bomb site. And the fact that you were not going to have any more air raids, the fact that no more soldiers were meant to die in fighting against the Germans in Europe was also something which, you know, really meant something to people. And we can see in the photos the sheer relief and delight that it was all over. After six years of war, there were probably an awful lot of people that thought, it's never going to end. Well, it did, and we were on the victorious side. But I think it's also important to know that VE Day went on for a day. And very soon, the we started to realise that the the war in the Far East was still going on, and that went on until the Japanese finally surrendered after the dropping of the two atomic bombs in August 1945. And once it was all over, people also started thinking about those people that they'd lost because so many people had died. This city was hit hard both because of the blitz and because when a ship went down then there were an awful lot of people from Plymouth who were going to lose loved ones. I remember my dad telling me about how you know he would he was a telegraph boy uh, during the war and he had to take telegrams around to people and sometimes ladies would say to him I'll just wait there there might be a reply and he said he would run because he knew very well because of the volume of telegrams that he had to deliver that what they were were messages telling people that their loved ones had gone down with the ship so the war was absolutely terrible and that's why people reacted with the sheer joy and outpouring of relief that we see in the pictures of VE Day. That generation put up with the war for six years. We've been in lockdown at the moment for six weeks. But six years they had to put up with things. But then the war was over and Plymouthians looked at their city and they saw that it had been flattened. But we'd endured and so on local and on national and on international levels it was time to rebuild. The buildings in the centre of Plymouth had to be rebuilt according to the Abercrombie plan and that's why we have the the way the city centre looks at the moment with Armada Way and the you know the buildings which you know were incredibly modern looking in their time but now are starting to look a little bit dated but the other thing that they had to do was that they also had to rebuild society men coming back after their service had to be given jobs and families needed homes the government also knew that they had to do something as well and first of all they did some things like saying thank you and to the servicemen then that was often in the form of medals and here you can see the picture of um, the letter from the king that accompanied my grandfather's medals he won the distinguished service medal after having uh, got two mentions in dispatches I think one of them was for the raid on Dieppe but like a lot of people of that generation he didn't really want to talk about what happened during the war so what did they decide to do well the main thing that the government decided to do to give back to people after everything that they'd suffered during the war was going to be the National Health Service and Belief in the National Health Service seems to be, according to a lot of surveys, 
one of the things that makes us British. We believe wholeheartedly in socialised healthcare. We believe that if you are sick, no matter who you are, you can go to a hospital and you will be cared for. And that, I think, is why the government is putting so much uh, attention into the National Health Service at the moment. I can speak from personal experience of what it was like, what it's like to be looked after by the NHS. Uh, I was in hospital after uh, a rather serious uh, blockage to the bowel. I had two operations after one didn't quite take, and I ended up in intensive care with a tracheotomy. Um, with machines taking over my breathing and being in an induced coma, which is not too dissimilar from what people are having to go through at the moment. And the one thing I can tell you is that when you are in that position and you're in an intensive care unit, you might think that the one thing that you were going to suffer is fear. And it's not. The only thing that I can remember about being in the intensive care unit is absolute calm, absolute kindness, and the very best of care that is available to anybody in the world. I can remember, you know, waking up and the way in which the doctor explained to me that I'd been out for a week, that I'd lost a week somewhere or other. <clears throat> I can remember them taking the tracheotomy out and then suddenly I was able to speak again. Um, I can remember them, you know, fussing over me when I woke up, getting me a TV because they, uh, uh, they understood that um, I probably wasn't very good at being bored. I can remember them finding out uh, things about me. They knew that I was a history teacher. They knew that I taught things like the Cold War. And so very often, I, I didn't used to sleep very much at, very much at night. Um, they found one nurse who'd been from the Czech Republic. And she came along and she sat with me, you know, for quite a long period, you know, kind of during one night, to tell me about what it was like to grow up under communism and that sort of stuff. But it's just the kindness that you remember. I remember when I'd come out of intensive care in the high dependency unit and had been moved up to a ward. And at the end of their shift, the intensive care nurses, they all came up to see me to find out who I was because I couldn't talk to them when I was down there and they wanted to see what I sounded like. So it's one of those things that we can be proud of. You know, an awful lot of people, unfortunately, are not getting through their time in intensive care because of the coronavirus. But an awful lot of people are getting through it. And the one thing we can that I can assure you is that the treatment that they're going to be getting is the best which is on offer. So VE Day. It was about the end of a war. We're just in the at the beginning of a very, very different sort of war. Um, we're at the beginning of probably a new way of running society as well. And those are things which require leadership, vision, creativity. And those are all the things which you lot are good at. That's why you're at DHS. You know, you're, you're bright guys, and what we want you to do is to go out into the wide world to use those skills, to use those, um, uh, those qualities that you've got for the benefit of everybody else. And the one thing I would like to say is that I have every faith that you lot can go out and do that. I think that you can go out and you can really, really make a difference in the future and you can build 
the new type of society that I'm afraid we're all going to need once we've got this thing under control. Thanks for listening. Stay safe. And to quote Vera Lynn, we will meet again. It is wonderful at times like these to be part of a community like ours, where we support each other, where if you're feeling isolated or afraid, there will always be someone ready to help you, where support is only an email or a phone call away. It isn't a community of staff and students and parents. It's more than that. It's a community of friends where we all help each other to get through even the most testing of times. And it's always good to know you've got a friend.
got a friend You got a friend yeah Ain't it good to know you got a friend Ain't it good to know you got a friend Oh yeah yeah You got a friend 